It is my pleasure to now introduce Emily Schaller, who basically, I think, many of you are, I'm sure, are here tonight because you know Emily's story, but she is a hero, if not a superhero, to so many with cystic fibrosis, to just so many don't have cystic fibrosis because she truly rocks CF. She is an adult with cystic fibrosis and founder of the Rock CF Foundation. She is also a marathon runner and, as you'll see, a source of inspiration for so many in this room and around this country and around the world. Her road to Rock CF, and I don't think I'm going to steal your thunder, That's fine. began when she was playing drums in Detroit, Michigan, in a Detroit-based rock band when she was younger. Actually, what do you call a cow Here we go. <laughs> who plays the drums? What to? No, you ready? Oh, you just had it. Yes, here. A musician. Bye. <laughs> I gotta go. Okay. <laughs> she went on from there <laughs> to leave me in the dust and went on to launch the Rock CF Foundation in 2007, whose goal is to heighten public awareness and raise funds to increase the quality of life for everyone with cystic fibrosis. She created and manages an internationally acclaimed line of merchandise to help fulfill the mission to rock and of Rock CF. Uh, one other fun fact, which we have, to, there are many fun facts about yeah, you, but in 2009, I believe you were a few years younger, just a couple, she rode her Vespa scooter from Chicago to Burbank, California. Is that true? research <laughs> Well, we, we have the best for doing this. In her quest to get on the Ellen DeGeneres show, her goal was to raise awareness for cystic fibrosis. Now, originally you started on a bicycle, bicycle. right? Yep. And what happened on the bike? Uh, I blew my Achilles. She blew her Achilles, so she got on a Vespa. She planned to ride her bike, got on a Vespa, had a tendon injury, right? That's right. And basically, <laughs> you completed the trip. And you got on? Not in the seat. Uh, I got the VIP treatment. I'm a vegetarian. They sent me to a steakhouse for dinner. That was all right. <laughs> well, you had a meet and greet. <laughs> I'm sorry. All right. <clears throat> <laughs> Emily's battle against cystic fibrosis has been run. It's it's a period, she, Her story's been in Runner's World, Forbes. The, has you been in the Burlington Free Press yet? Yes. Yeah. Oh, have she I? has. Because you haven't made it till you make the Burlington I've Free Press. Okay. Tonight's the night. We'll make it one way or right. another. New York Times, Washington Post. That's just that's just you know, small small town. USA Today, uh, NPR. You name it. She has been on it. And basically, many cystic fibrosis focused educational websites. She has so many attributes that I loved, as you can tell, learning about you, but particularly her passion for educating others about cystic fibrosis and her being able to do it, believe it or not, with an incredible sense of humor, far better than the guys at the podium. As she addresses everyone on this particular illness and the ever changing and improving treatments that are being made to inspire others to literally transform their lives with exercise, diet, and goal setting. Please, let's give it up. Oh, wow. Let's rock CF for Emily Schaller. Wow. Oh, um, yeah. So, thank you for having me. I'm pumped. The closest I've been to here was Vermont. I'm just kidding. Uh, New Hampshire. Uh, it's the same thing, right? No, it's not. It's not. It's not. Okay, sorry. I like New Hampshire, but Vermont's better. So, I'm going to, yeah, that's right. I'm going to share with you my life with CF. I'm now 37 years old, so I've got a lot of, like, three decades of um, the CF world that I'll, I'll just share my life. We can ask questions before, during, after, whatever you guys want. This is, I'm here for you tonight to have a little fun and hopefully you leave you with a little bit of hope because, um, the two presentations before mine, I don't know about you, but I was awfully smiley during, uh, where we're going here with CF treatment. So we'll start, uh, not born with a bowl cut, but that came shortly after, um, I was born in 1982. This is before newborn screening, right? And I actually read today that Colorado had newborn screening in 1982. They were the only state that had it. Interesting. Yeah. So I have two older brothers who do not have CF. And when my mom helped me for the first time, she knew something wasn't quite right. And we're still working on trying to figure out everything. But uh, yeah, it might take a while. But um, I was 6 pounds, 10 ounces, normal delivery, normal pregnancy. But she held me. And she's like, something is just not right. Doctor said, look, she's really cute, she's fine, send her home, nothing wrong. Months start to go on and I develop like chronic ear infections, upper respiratory infection, um, diapers. You guys uh, familiar with changing diapers? <laughs> a 
for a baby with CF who isn't treated with enzymes? Sweet. Um, so my dad was the diaper man in the house. And my parents used cloth diapers. Yeah. I mean, you guys, it's Vermont. You guys probably do some cloth diapers out here too, right? So I think we were the number one customer in the diaper service, customers of the year or two. Um, but I was just like going through them like crazy. So my pediatrician told my parents, you know, we should just test her for cystic fibrosis. My parents um, were like, sure, great. We don't know what that is. This is 1980s. There wasn't Facebook. There were no huge awareness campaigns. No family history at all, right? First test came back negative, and they told my parents I had failure to thrive. So my parents were a little freaked out about that, thinking they did something wrong, right? Why isn't our baby thriving? Um, months went on again, and the symptoms started to get worse, and eventually had, you guys done eating? I had the old rectal prolapse. Hey, oh, Google that. Don't YouTube it, but, or image search it. Just read about it. Um, so, oh, that's better, right? That was a little hummy. Cool. So, immediately sent me to the hospital uh, to, this time, a CF-accredited care center. Very important. Did another sweat test, and that came back positive. So, that was 1983. I'm 18 months old. This is the 80s, okay? Awesome music. Awesome cars. Not awesome treatments for CF. I told my parents, um, at the prognosis at the time was that I probably wouldn't live long enough to graduate from high school because that's what they were seeing, right? If you look at the median age of survival, it wasn't completely accurate. Maybe it was like 20, 22. But what the doctors were seeing in the care center was just that, like teens, right? So my parents were freaked out. This presentation is a little freaked out at that too, I think. <coughs> um, they were told, okay, here are your options. You're going to start her on pancreatic enzymes, which I still remember those capsules that we opened up and put on applesauce. Some of you guys might be in that phase right now. Love. Oh, pears. Oh, interesting. It's exotic out here on the East Coast. <laughs> um, vitamins, A, D, E, and K, and then chest physical therapy. So my parents were told they, were, they had beat me. And yeah, that was really, a really nice time in my life. My dad is six foot seven, okay? I'm five foot two, so that growth chart that you showed is very accurate. We're not, we don't quite grow. So my dad would lay me down on his legs, right? So my head would be at his feet, and he'd just pound away. He's a gentle giant. He's huge, but he's a, a bear with giant bear hands. And when they're bear hands, his hands look like bear hands, okay? <laughs> Lou, you could clean that up for me. Yeah, okay, thank you. <laughs> just email me, okay? Uh, so he would like, he was a musician, taught uh, school, he was a music teacher, he would teach me paradiddles and drum beats, which is how I got my first intro into music, right? Then my mom was the athlete in the family, about my size, but she had this whip in her hand, not like a whip, but this whip of her hand, and whenever my parents would come in and do this treatment, right, I'd look to see, did they take the rings off? Like, they would always walk in, take the rings off, put them on top of the dresser. Sometimes if I was being a little jerk, I assume uh, that's why they left the rings on. So mom would get in there and just like whip, whip, whip. I'm like, wow, I really wish dad was here to do this. But that's what we did. That was the first, gosh, 12 years of my life, right? My parents got the diagnosis. I had CF. But they were, and I'm discovering this more and more as I talk to them. Like, how did you feel when you guys got that diagnosis, right? And they said they cried for a few weeks straight. And then they're like, okay, now what are we going to do? We're not going to treat her any different. She's going to be just like her brothers, um, tomboy, and uh, skateboard and play basketball and play t-ball. And talking to some of you parents tonight, I'm so inspired by, and grandparents, about what your kids and grandkids are doing. Running track, girls on the run, basketball lacrosse. This is all stuff that kind of helped me help, kept me healthy. How are we doing? I'm just riffing. This isn't even my story I'm telling right now. I'm just talking about some research I've done online. <laughs> I'll, I'll just keep talking. <laughs> right. So 19, because then I don't really know what's next on my thing. I've done it 9,000 times, but I'm, I've changed it up a little bit. Oh, right, with the bowl cut. We're good. Oh, I got it right here. Whoa. And, okay, so the family of bowl cuts. That's, <laughs> that's right. Exactly. Except for my dad, who uh, had the comb over. <laughs> my mom would go grocery shopping and buy my dad tons of hairspray. And he would spray that comb over down. But when it went flying, it brought a six foot seven 
itself to a seven foot one man. <laughs> and it is genetic. So I think that's me pre diagnosis. So, yeah, this is me as a kid skateboarding with my brothers, hanging out. As soon as the sun went up and came up in the morning, we were outside until my mom whistled that night to come back for dinner. Then we went back out until the sun went down. Uh, I meant to insert a slide here, but I didn't have time. And it's me in a bathing suit and my neighbors, uh, when I was a kid, a giant dirt pile. They were redoing their garden and their mom had like a hose on the dirt. And I'm like going head first down this dirt hill. And now you're like not even allowed to look at dirt if you're a kid with CF. But um, I mean, those are different times, right? So this is me uh, doing chores because there was no break in my childhood. I had to do what my brothers did. I got no special treatment because I had CF. I am still searching for this um, sweater that I'm wearing. <laughs> I ask every, every state I've gone to for the past couple years, if you see this in a good, we'll pick it up and I'll exchange it for a couple Rock CF shirts. But those are panda bears and it's actually a sweater vest. So <laughs> I just put that in there, product placement. Um, Outside, manual labor. My dad's making me build a deck. He's laughing in the background. Um, but this was just my childhood, right? We didn't have to worry about And I, I talk to parents now, and it's like, I understand where you're coming from. Your kids are doing Pomazine and Toby. They're doing all these treatments, right, and the vest. I had enzymes, vitamins, and, but a couple times a day I'd have to come and my parents would have to beat me. I think that was more supposed to be once a day, but I think they did it a few times just to... <laughs> I'm the third child, okay? I was a jerk. So this is it. This is a table. That's not my mom. That's at CF camp, which I'll, which I'll get to in a couple of minutes here. But uh, I had this orange table in my bedroom. And early on, I was little enough that I could just lay down on my parents' feet, right? Or prop up on pillows. But then they invented this revolutionary device, uh, a <laughs> table that you could incline, make it higher or lower, and they just pound you. So... That was it. I mean, that's what we we're dealing with here in the 90s. This is at CF camp. Imagine it. 300 people with CF. <laughs> bunking together. Getting, this kind of reminds me of CF camp right here. They just put um, 50 of those PT tables and just coughing and spitting on each other, sharing enzymes, n inhaled um, nebulizer treatments in the bunks. Oh, yeah. It's not going to happen now, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so they did. So I went a few years. I didn't really dig it because I didn't like being away from my family, but it was nice to be there with a bunch of people who get what you're going through, right? As, uh, eventually, as Sapatia started coming up, they separated the camp into two separate times. So it would be the non sapatia group for five days, then the second uh, group with the Sapatia kids. Then they're like, mm, maybe this isn't a great idea. <laughs> yeah. But there would be kids in the hospital with me that would get out of the hospital, go to camp, and then come back to the hospital. It was staffed by PTs, RTs, nurses. It was quite a special thing. Now we have Facebook <laughs> and some great CFF things, peer-to-peer -peer mentor. Is that what it's called? Yeah, cool. So the first decade of my life was just a lot of fun, and I was super active, and I think that played into me being a healthy kid, right? I went to the... CF clinic every three months, two to three months in downtown Detroit. Would get weighed, would do, they started doing breathing tests when I was a kid. They weren't even out yet. So my oldest brother was actually one of the healthy patients that tried the breathing machine uh, uh, before anybody with CF did. So early 90s is really when we started seeing CF focused treatments, right? Pomazam came out when I was 11, and that was the first treatment that I ever had that like made me realize, like, oh, I have CF, like what is all this, right? Now you guys are born into it. They're like, here, start this, 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 this is how you're doing it. And for me, it was like, okay, what, what is this, right? So I remember in third grade, I was running out on the playground and I started to cough, right? And it was a cough that kind of went on. You guys know a CF cough. It's not just a quick little cough. It's one that keeps going. And I stopped and I like caught my breath and I was like, oh. Maybe this is why I go to CF clinic and get weighed and get blood tests every three months. This is CF. This is why I take enzymes. And it was kind of that like aha moment that I had. And my parents and I, we never really sat down and talked like, this is what CF is. These are the symptoms. This is what it means. Some of your parents are probably better at that than my parents were. They're amazing people, but we never had that like open conversation. But it was that first time that I realized I had CF and what it possibly could be, right? 
and the CF cough wasn't going away. Or was it? So Toby came out in 97, then Kasten, ibuprofen for a little while, caused, gave me heartburn, but it was good for inflammation, I assume, right? Um, so these things started to come into our toolbox, right, these treatments. And they correlated with an increased median age of survival, right? So that's, it's kind of an astonishing graph to look at from no treatments, 1930s. This is 2010, it's almost a decade old, but just to see that jump and correlating with the treatments and the one in the next decade could be even more exciting. So super healthy childhood, right? My first tune up for hospitalization was in seventh grade. And that was a little scary, right? I'm sure you guys, if you've had an admission, you might remember that first time where my doctor's like, you're gonna need to go in the hospital. And I'm like, for what? In my mind, I pictured, this is what I pictured. I'd be on a table, like that one incline table, getting PT, like on a conveyor belt, 24 hours a day in the hospital, just like, and just having people lined up pounding me. When I got there, it wasn't quite that, which is good. But um, it was a little scary, because I thought like, is this what, is this gonna keep happening? I wasn't quite sure what was gonna happen, right? In for a couple days, then back home, uh, did IVs at school, put the little pill, or the little baby bottle in my coat pocket, or hoodie pocket, went to class, did everything just like I would do uh, if I wasn't sick. But these uh, infections started to occur more, right? The older we get with CF, generally, the worse our lung function gets because of these chronic infections. So for me, it went from once in seventh grade, once in eighth grade, two to three times a year in high school, prom from high school, we had the after party in my hotel room at Children's Hospital, pop some apple cider. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. Uh, and Christmas, New Year's, every holiday spent in the hospital, right? That was my home. Children's Hospital in Detroit was my second home. Um, as I got older, also my lung function started to drop. So I had these dreams of being a pro basketball player before. <laughs> That's fine. I get it. <laughs> before there was the WNBA. Do you guys have any? Are there any pro teams in Vermont? No. You guys aren't too excited about that. <laughs> All right. I'm not sure if the WNBA is still around. I think it is, right? Charles Sparks? OK. Um, so like, I remember in fifth grade writing what I wanted to be when I grew up, and it was like a <laughs> pro basketball player. But I didn't grow. And then uh, as I got older, my lung function started to decline. So I discussed this with somebody tonight about you can play sports up until middle school, but once you get to high school, like if you're not a good athlete, then you're not going to go far. So I didn't grow, and as my lung function started to decline, I couldn't keep up with the other kids, right? So by eighth grade, I was riding the pine, like not good. I could shoot, but I just couldn't keep up with the kids, couldn't run down the court. I became a better uh, football manager and theater student than I was a basketball player. So my hoop dreams were shattered uh, at a young age. Um, and then as I got to high school, like I just, my lung function was probably like 50s, 60%, no sport. I, gym was my favorite, uh, gym and lunch were my favorite school subjects because eating was my favorite. But I never, it was hard, right? Exercise was hard, so I didn't do it, which is why a lot of us, CF or not, don't do it because it's hard, right? So seeing my lung function go down, seeing me being in the hospital for three to four times a year for three to five weeks at a time, I just wasn't quite sure what my future was going to be. Graduated high school, thought I was going to move to New York City. I'm a big Broadway nerd. Any Hamilton fans? Oh yeah, oh yeah, you want to do a little duet. <laughs> he said it's okay, that's fine, that's fine. <laughs> All right, later, I'll buy you another drink. Um, <laughs> so oh, we had a good conversation today about um, transitioning to adult care, which is something all of you will hopefully face. Uh, I didn't transition to adult care until I was 25 because I kept telling my CF team at Children's, I'm moving to New York. There's no reason for me to transition. Why waste your time? Why waste my time? So for five years, six years actually, I told them I was moving to New York. I never did. I decided to stay in Detroit and uh, study theater and uh, take a very long hiatus after two years. I'm still on that hiatus. 
but uh, the transition thing is really, it's really difficult. And some parents I've heard say it's more difficult for them than the kids. But when you're seeing this whole care team since you're a little kid, and then if you're inpatient, you get to know those nurses up there and the PTs on the floor and the people that deliver your food and the people that clean your room every day, like that's your family. I'm not good with saying goodbye. So like that was my hardest thing. It's not, I already knew how to take care of myself and I already know some of you um, or your kids or your grandkids are starting to learn how to do their medications uh, preteen. I had no problem doing my medication. I just didn't want to leave. So I know you might have a kid in that boat too. <laughs> She's moving. She's going to be moving. Um, so that was hard. That was hard because also I wasn't at my healthiest. I was at my absolute sickest at that time. So I, I was scared to switch to a new center because I decided to go to a different center completely um, outside of Detroit. So it was a scary time. So what did I do? I just start playing drums in a rock band in smoky bars around Detroit, <laughs> living the life, not doing my best, not doing my Pomazime. Stellar, stellar role model in my early 20s. Where I was in an all-girl band called Helen, which all of you have never heard of. I can guarantee that. <laughs> Do not YouTube that. Okay. Please. Now, I'm not going to play you a video, but you can research on your own if you want to see our hits. <laughs> we didn't know what we were doing. We started the band. These were my friends. I'm like, you want to play bass? You play guitar? I'm going to play drums. Let's audition a singer. We didn't even know how to play a dang song, and we are auditioning a singer. <laughs> <laughs> but we did it. So we played around Detroit for like five or six years, maybe seven. And uh, it was fun, but my health was horrible. I was partying a little too late most weekends, setting up drums at seven in the evening and playing in the bar until two in the morning, smoky bars. It's not good. Not a good um, time in my life. And now I recognize that I could have, we're discussing mental health, right? And um, anxiety and depression, that stuff wasn't talked about when I was that age, so I'm sure there was some of that going on, uh, and recognizing it now kind of helps a little bit. So, rocking and rolling, living on uh, Social Security disability because I was too sick to work. I was uh, folding shirts at my friend's t-shirt store in Detroit, making a cool like eight bucks an hour, dropped out of college. My parents who were both teachers were super pumped with my uh, decision making in my life. Um, they're like, great, what are you going to do? Well, I'm going to play drums and um, work a minimum wage job with my friends and enjoy life. And they're like, okay. But they supported me through it all, right? And playing in the band and working in the merchandise industry has kind of paid off today with Rock CF, which we'll talk about a little bit. But I was kind of at like a rock bottom in my life, right? And this was a time where I was so sick. I didn't know what my future was going to be. Um, I was scared. But I knew there was something else I could and should be doing, right? And doing all my treatments, eventually started to do my treatments after a couple of years off. My vest got a little dusty, not good. So I first moved out on my own and then my vest got dusty and that correlated with my sickness. So here we are. Um, what is the one thing that could help me break out of this cycle? And that's what it was, a cycle, right? We, if you're, I don't want to say my generation, which I've said a few times today when I was with Lori, but 37, in the hospital the past 20 some years of my life. Once you go in once, and then you go in a second time that year, it can become a cycle. Like, I'm out of the hospital, it's been two months, it's time to go back in. And it just becomes comfortable, right? So I had to do something that was uncomfortable, and that's what exercise is. So hopefully this works. Yeah, <laughs> everyone, I don't know, hold your breath. It's a silent film. Uh, <laughs> the cystic fibrosis is something that you're born with, but causes your body to produce this really thick and sticky in the lungs trap bacteria. Then the bacteria turns into a, a lung infections. And that's kind of like why people die from CI, this lung issues. I told my parents I wouldn't live long enough to graduate from high school. I 
wouldn't be here today without running. But we just run through the streets of Detroit, through the old neighborhoods, and people just want to get rid of them and tear them down. And, but they don't see other opportunities. That's the way I see life. It's like, what can I do with what's in front of me? I was couch potato. I was so inactive. My lung function was probably 50 to 60 percent. I was in the hospital two to three times a year treating lung infections. I was playing drums in a rock band, and I can kind of consider that exercise. Then I decided I'm sick of being sick. What can I do to change my life? So I started running. When I first started, I set out to run two miles. In reality, I ran a block, stopped at the stop sign, bent over and just started coughing and spitting everywhere. And after three months of training, my lung function climbed up to like 70%. So that was like, okay, you have to do this. Now, I don't know what kept me going. I guess I wanted to really prove myself that I could do it. If you're lucky and technology works, you can watch the second part of that video. <laughs> I don't actually run in that area where they film this. <laughs> so yeah, they're like, Let's, we should film in this spot. And I'm like, no, you can, it's not even a thing. You can't run there. <laughs> I'm like hopping over shoes and old couches. Like, yeah, but it's, it's, it's really nice looking. I'm like, well. <laughs> They had like a drone and the drone crashed on top of that place. It's like really, really, and then a week later, Google this, a week later a company from Europe was in filming a movie and they brought a lion and the lion got loose in that area. Yeah. I'm like, we were just a week too early. That would have been amazing. That's how we make the news in Burlington Press. So yeah, I don't know if you guys have like tried to start an exercise routine. And never? Okay, cool. After like not doing it for a while, and it's like you envision something, and then what really happens uh, isn't reality, or isn't what you were envisioning. Yeah, that was me. So like when I say I was the couch potato, or the couch that a potato sat on, that was absolutely true. So I would only run if it was like pouring, and my car was right there. I would run to my car, <laughs> then get in my car and cough, and like have a massive coughing attack and spit in a spittoon in my car, which was common. In uh, there's a reason I don't have it there anymore, which we'll get to. But um, so I decided, like, I'm going to start running. And I gear up. And how many runners are in the house? Yeah, I like that. Uh, the doc who's presented the, present, the data. Is it? You have a nice Garmin on. Do you run? I was, yeah, I was peeping on your Garmin. I'm like, what do you got, a 945? <laughs> uh -huh. I'll trade you later. <laughs> um, so yeah, I thought, I mean, you guys are runners, and when you're running, you see people who must be new to running, and they're dressed like they're running in subarctic temperatures. I don't know if subarctic's a thing, but, but it's like 50 degrees out, and you're like so overdressed. That was me. I put on like anything you can imagine, and thought I was going to go sprint two miles, and made it a block, and I was like, oh, this isn't going good. This is not good. So I'm like coughing and spitting. I think the neighbors... Like, I was in, living with my parents in their subdivision. I'm like, oh, the neighbors must be looking at me through their shades because I'm, like, hunched over and coughing and spitting. So I made it to that, like, half a block. And I thought to myself, like, okay, that didn't go as planned, but I'm not going to go back. I'm going to, like, walk to the next corner. And then I'm going to sp sprint because when you start running, you're supposed to sprint right away. I'm going to sprint to the next intersection and the next no parking sign. So it took, like, three months to build up to run those one or two miles, right? And when you can do that, that's like a big thing, right? You're like, wow, I, I did that after coming off the couch, and now I'm doing this. And, of course, every new runner goes out way too fast. So when I talk to new runners, especially CF peeps, I'm like, run 10 times slower than you think you're supposed to run because you have to get that breath and that rhythm, right? So um, after months, um, my lung function improved from, like, low 60s or 50s up to 74. And I was like, oh, there's something to this, right? And at the same time, I started cycling as well. So I was riding my bike from Detroit to Chicago with friends to raise money for CF. And I'm like, wow, this is not who I was like six months ago, but this is the new me. Um, and with the increased exercise and new lifestyle, lifestyle change, uh, was a change of diet as well. So growing up in the 80s or 90s with CF, uh, where's my dietitians? Oh, yeah, cool. 
Uh, <laughs> I get real excited when I travel and I see dietitians speak and they're like avocados and nuts and like healthy good fats, right? But my generation, yep, <laughs> skim board. Um, my generation was like, eat McDonald's 16 times a day, cake, scanty shakes, anything, just calories in your body, calories in. Which, as a kid, I took a full advantage of that. There we go. But at, you might just want to stand there. Yeah, be good. I'll give you a free Roxy up here. <laughs> so my diet was not amazing. Uh, and when I was playing in the band, it was even worse because you're like up all night and you're just eating fast food all the time, um, lung, lung infections all the time, tons of inflammation. So I was like reading about um, exercise and how diet is in correlation, can work together. So I started like shifting my diet a little bit to like a uh, – just like a healthier situation, more whole foods, plant-based. And then I fully adopted it like 10 years ago when I started running, and I've got more energy than I've ever had. And I've got a lot of uh, um, obstructions, intestinal obstructions. So the change in diet has helped with that, and um, I like it. So I still get the question every time I speak, but how do you get your protein? And I'm like, whoa, do we have any protein deficiencies in the U.S.? Do we? Is that a thing? Yeah. You eat your kale. I had two salads tonight. How about that? <laughs> but it is more challenging. Now that I'm on Kaleidico, there's making sure I get enough fat when I take Kaleidico. Um, but yeah, especially with um, running and training and uh, fueling. So it's really important, like before I run or bike, what, what to eat. I take electrolyte tabs and salt tabs. And post exercise is very important. So when I do talk to people with CF who are training for their first triathlon or first endurance run, it's nice to talk to them about uh, what to eat during the race and after, after the race and training. So very, it's gotten kind of fun. If you're uh, into running, it gets a little obsessive sometimes. Yeah, type A personality. So I put this up here, and I know, um, Charlotte, you talked about clinical trials. Do you know how many are going on in Vermont? I, I was supposed to research that, but I didn't. I like eight. Eight is great. So I put this up here because why I'm here alive and thriving today is exercise, a change in my diet, clinical trials. I've been participating since I was a little kid, not only for the money, if you're watching kids, it pays pretty good. <laughs> but that's not why you participate in a clinical trial. It's just a bonus. But yeah, like early on, I was in the Toby study, so phase two and three for Toby. Um, and these other little like zinc studies and all these quality of life studies, which were great. Um, but the biggest thing that totally changed my life, and uh, it's really why I'm here today, and we'll talk about quality of life in a minute, but um, I was approached in 2009, I think, by my former CF care team at Children's, and they're like, Emily, you qualify for this drug, a clinical trial out of Cleveland, right? I'm like, Oh, what? That's not close. That's like a three-hour drive for me, but tell me more. And I, then I was thinking, like, oh, I get mileage. That's good. So if I got to drive <laughs> <laughs> Mileage, meals, hotel, it's fun. Um, and they're like, yeah, it's for one of your mutations. So this is where we're at, right? I get approached all the time. Like, I had a CF dad come and visit me at the office last week. He's like, what are your mutations? And I'm like, whoa, uh, you got to buy me a drink before you ask me that question. <laughs> like, I'm from the, the era of treating CF as one, uh, medication-wise. We're just treating CF with a broad stroke. We're giving uh, Toby and we're giving Pomazyme and enzymes. You have CF. Here are your drugs. But now we're looking at mutations. So when I was approached for this trial, I'm like, I don't even know what my mutations are. And now you guys know ASAP, right? It's so, it's so cool to meet parents of newly diagnosed or younger kids because they're like, even the dads know. I'm like, my dad has no clue what my mutations are. <laughs> that's not a, that's not a, that's just a, joke at my dad, I guess. <laughs> I take it back. Um, so I'm like, sure, I'll do this study. So every seven days, I drove down to Cleveland, right? Two and a half, three hours. Day after Christmas, in the car, driving down to Cleveland for, I think, phase two must have been six months, maybe? It was super long. So I'm going down there. I'm getting um, blood work. I'm getting an NPD, which where they shove a tube up your nose, and uh, somebody stares at you for 20 minutes while they feed liquid through a syringe up your nose, and you have to stare at them. If you sneeze, you have to start over. 
So that's definitely a phase two trial is more uh, invasive. <laughs> so I'm doing all these things. They're like, here's your pill. And I'm like, a pill? Like, that's not going to do anything. I took zinc before. I took, had an ibuprofen. I know what you're trying to do with your pills for CF. I'm like, no, a CF treatment's like Toby or something you inhale right to the lungs. Totally effective. So I'm like, fine, I'll take your pill. So phase two trial, I get an exacerbation. I don't feel any better. I roll with it, though, because I'm banking. I'm like buying a new iPad. I don't know what I bought back then, but I definitely didn't invest it in my future, which I should have. And will with the next clinical trial I'm on. So phase two wraps up. I'm like, that was cute. Thank you for allowing me to visit your city, Cleveland. Then phase three rolls along, and my CF nurse at U of M calls. She's like, you want to do phase three? I'm like, great. Still don't know what this drug is, but it's a little closer. Count me in, because my parents have always said that clinical trials are important. So I drive to U of M, get started on this thing, take the little blue pill, which is now known as blue lightning. <laughs> take this drug, four days in, I'm walking down the street with my brother in Florida, and I stop and I'm like, take this breath that I've never been able to take in my whole life. I'm now, was that 2010, 2011? Um, I don't know how old I was. Born in 82, 30. Somebody give me some math. <laughs> 2010 minus 1982. I don't know. Early 30s, right? So I take this deep breath, late 20s. And I said to my brother, I'm like, dude, I think I'm on this stuff. He's like, what? I'm like, I don't know what is happening right now, but I just took a deep breath that I've never been able to take in my whole life. And we laugh a lot in my family. So I, usually when you laugh and you have CF, it turns into a 10-minute coughing fit, followed by a five-minute recovery period at the at the shortest amount. So we start laughing and I'm like, I'm like not coughing. I'm not, I'm not producing mucus. I feel crazy. And it felt as if somebody like took a finger and if I had a switch on the back of my head, they like switched this little um, switch up. And they're like, this is how you're supposed to live. Like this is what you've been missing out on for 30 years of your life, right? So I felt great and I'm like, I don't really know what this stuff is. So Go back to my care center, do a pulmonary function test, and my FEV was 88%. And I was like, holy, that's incredible to go from 74 into the high 80s. I've never seen those numbers in my whole life. Um, that's a little graph for you. But I think the most important thing is, sure, like my lung function is great. I didn't cough any mucus up for a year and a half after starting this medication. And I just like felt head to toe like a different person. Um, the proof is in the pudding, though, with CF when we look at the sweat chloride levels, right? So we looked at the two new Vertex drugs that are coming out, the um, re reduction of sodium chloride. So I'm like, if this stuff's really working, then my sweat is not going to be very salty. So normally when you bike and you have CF or you run a lot, like my black bike shorts would be gray with salt crystals, right? I always thought I'd start an organic farm, <laughs> salt farm. So I'm like, i got to see if this stuff is really working. So I go to the gym, and I hop on an elliptical. And I'm on an elliptical, and it's like a small room with mirrors all around. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to lick my arm and see <laughs> if I'm salty. <laughs> so I licked my right arm, and I'm like, okay, I'm not very salty. So a true scientist, I learned this. Is it a control? If I lick my other arm, is that what you do in science? <laughs> like. <laughs> I'll know if it's really working if I lick my other arm. So I lick it, and I'm like, okay, this, this, I'm not salty anymore, right? So I freak out. I'm like texting my people. I'm like, I'm really on this stuff. It's really working. I'm not salty. And my friends, like, growing up in middle school would lick me because they're like, oh, she's salty. Let's lick her. So <laughs> your kids are in for the ride of their lifetime. I'm just telling you right now. But maybe not. If we get them these drugs, they won't be salty. So uh, this stuff happens. Now I'm running, like, training for half marathons and marathons and my cough, I'm running and I'm not coughing. Usually I would leave a trail, so if I got lost, there'd be a trail of sputum to follow, but that's not happening anymore, right? So my life had completely changed. Um, on paper, it looks great, and doctors present, they're like, yeah, this is nice. Uh, pulmonary uh, FEV improved by, I think, 10% for colatico. Weight, on average, was up six pounds per person. All these things are great on paper, right? It's great. My patients say they feel great. Stat Statistically, my sweat chloride level could be at or below a CF diagnosis. This stuff's great. But when it's actually you, the person who's benefiting from this drug, 
it's like I can't even describe it. You guys can describe it on paper and we can look at the data from studies and talk to physicians about it. But when it's you or me who's actually on this stuff, I can't even, I still wake up and I'm like, holy crap. Like I envisioned my life uh, 11 years ago and it's completely different. Um, I've since run a couple marathons. I'm training for one in October, Chicago. That should be fun. Uh, running is my life. I bought a house. So here we go. Let's talk about, let's talk about these drugs and where your kids are going to be, where people like me are heading because of drugs like this and all the research over time, really. We're not done yet, of course, but where we've come. So I bought a house. Never thought in my life, why would I want to buy a house? Like, that's crazy. I'm not even, I don't even work. I don't even uh, have a future. So I buy this house. Now I have to cut my own grass and I, ha I use a battery powered one. You guys should be proud. In Vermont, right? That's good. <laughs> uh, shovel my driveway because we get a lot of snow and ice in Detroit. Um, I don't play in the dirt. I let somebody else do that for me so I, just to avoid any weird bugs. Um, that's my dog. Friends and family. So I've got this quality of life that never in my life would I envision, right? And when I speak to med students, especially and parents uh, of newly diagnosed, I'm like, you guys, where we're heading with CF now is 180 degrees. Is that a 360, 180? I'm not good at math. But it's not even, it wasn't even on my parents' radar, right? I'm sure they hoped for these type of things, but it's a reality now for myself and your kids, right? So I'm excited. Retirement fund, I've got a cool $3,030 in it. I'll be taking donations outside after this. <laughs> is Bernie, is anyone with money around that we can hit up on the streets? Um, it's exciting. It's scary at the same time that we're on the forefront of, I'm paving the way for your kids, right? Your kids are going to be like, this is just life, right? I'm going to work. I'm going to work full time. I'm going to retire. This is it. But for us, we're like in that weird balance of how the hell do we do this, right? So we're figuring it out for your kids. Um, I get asked a lot if my treatment has changed since Colidico. And of course, um, I still culture pseudomonas and have bronchiectasis and pancreatic issues. So I'm on the full routine of Vest, Pomazyme, Toby Pothaler, trying to be more compliant with that. Um, yeah, and exercise, right? So that's the, one of the biggest things for me. We can play this quick, I guess. I think you guys, we skipped over the second video, but that's better for you guys. See me. See me, champion. See me. See me swim. See me. See me lead. Rock CF is a community, thousands strong, changing the face of what living with cystic fibrosis looks like and giving those living with CF the tools not only to survive, but thrive. Raising for CFF and doing uh, events with CFF and playing in a band and uh, folding 
t-shirts at my friends' shops and working for the Red Wings and the Tigers and thought like, what am I going to do with my life now? I'm a couple years post-college hiatus. Um, so I decided I'm going to found the Rock CF Foundation and I had no clue what the heck I was doing when I founded this thing. I'm like, I'll just do some fundraisers and uh, donate money to research and then that's going to be great. But then it started picking up, right? So our rock concerts uh, shifted to runs because at that time my lifestyle started to change and get into more healthier things. So we do a half marathon every year. It'll be year 10 in March next year. And we get like, we get like 23, 2,500 runners a year to come down and run with us. And now these people are part of our cause. They're part of the CF fight, right? And they're just runners, but they come to our race because they love our race. And now they're part of our team, right? So I kind of developed and changed. This is, oh, this is it? <laughs> is there a coat hanger? Is there a, a sheep thing? This is fun. Yeah, put a quarter in. I got one. <laughs> you guys take Michigan quarters here? Oh, no. <laughs> so all of this knowledge came together to form Rock CF, and it's been fun to transition, and as my life has changed, move the mission of Rock CF that way. So you may have seen some shirts. You could be proud owner of one tonight. Um, I wanted to, even with the rock and roll concerts back then, there's only 30,000 people that we know of in the U.S. with CF, and I wanted to make it known and get it out there. So that's kind of what we did with the rock and roll concerts. That's what we do with our runs around. And um, I'm merch, I love merch. So we started this merchandise company and years later we've probably sold, there's at least 20,000 of those on the street between all of our runs and what we sell. We ship all over like Estonia, people buy stuff online. I'm like, I don't even know what this country is, but we'll ship it. <laughs> I'm not sure how it's gonna get to you, but it'll get, we'll make sure it gets there. Here's your tracking number. <laughs> Post a uh, hashtag uh, on Instagram. So it's been really fun to watch it grow. And um, one of the coolest programs we have is Kicks Back. And one of my favorite recipients uh, has gotten a few pair of shoes from us. So our goal with this is to donate running shoes to people with CF to either A, get them off the couch like me. Like I had to get off the couch and walk that first half a block or a mile. Or, um, oh man, I've got... <laughs> You don't want to watch another video, do you? Um, or we've got other people, uh, especially in my area, my buddy Josh, who ran Boston this year. He runs Boston every year. He's running through shoes like crazy, right? So we have the same doctor, and it's just fun to compare stories uh, with him and see how many miles he gets. So with Kicks Back, we donate the shoes uh, to either get them to their first 5K or whatever, whatever it is, right? And we'll pay for that race, too. So we'll pay for... Uh, somebody's half marathon, marathon, 5K, we'll just get them out there and get them going and keep them going throughout the year. So it's a good program. We've actually donated over 600 pairs of shoes in the past, uh, I think, three years. So my goal is two or 300 this year. Sponsors, if you're listening. <laughs> it's just a new video about Kicks Back, but we'll, you guys can look at that online. So there's Josh. There's another buddy. And we usually start like age five or six, so please... Um, and I've heard doctors tell me, like, you can give them running shoes, but it doesn't mean they're going to run. And I'm like, well, you can prescribe Pomazon. It doesn't mean they're going to do it. <laughs> so that battle doesn't work for me. So if somebody else with CF in, is giving you these shoes and they can look at somebody or 600 others as inspiration, you got a good chance. So if your kids or grandkids are active or you want them to get active and they need a little push, go kicks back. We've gotten people who are in their 70s with uh, CF some shoes, so... That's where we're going, guys. Empower is a great program through Attain Health. It's one-on-one -on -one <clears throat> health and wellness coaching, fitness, so they'll design specific programs for people with CF and coach them virtually. They also have a CFRD component that they added recently, so if you guys check that out for sure, it's uh, one of the programs we fund because we want people to start thinking beyond just what's our lung function today and this year and is it going up. With these new drugs, um, from Vertex that are coming out and down the road, RNA therapy, these other drugs. So we're going to be living very long, right? So as somebody who has already experienced that, we need to start looking at heart disease, cancers, other real-life adult issues. So I think we'll shift in more of that direction as, as we start aging, right? So uh, the first geriatric CF center, I'm looking forward to that. You get your Velcro shoes and the little walker with the <laughs> tennis ball on the bottom. And uh, that's where we're going. So I'm super excited. I couldn't be more excited about the future. And hope is a word that we like 
kind of throw around loosely a lot, but I mean, for CF, the story of CF is, I tell people this all the time, it's like the greatest story in medicine because it's shifting so rapidly. So three decades of my life we just talked about. The last 10 years, it's gonna be almost four decades in a couple years, have been incredible with the uh, treatments that have come out and <clears throat> just the inspiration with people living with CF. This is uh, a lot of us, adults living with CF right here. So we'll end it with this and then Q&A, right? If you guys are in. How do they win the prizes? <laughs> oh, is that a can of worms? Oh, it's a joke. Oh, there's no prizes, so have fun. <laughs> oh, that's right. Yep, if you won, you can pick something from the basket. Is there anything you guys have? I don't know. <laughs> it's a good, I mean, it's a good question. Like, how did I get started to go from couch potato, sick all the time, to starting to run an exercise and turn it into a nonprofit? I think I'd always had, always had like a glimmer of hope somewhere, even though I was nervous about what, where my life was going. Like, is all of this worth this if I don't know what I have in store, right? So, uh, Good friends and family, my one brother who was also in a rock band helped me get Rock CF started. And then it kind of all just fell into place and social media really started picking up at the time. So MySpace, anyone? <laughs> I think they just deleted all our profiles. I'm a little bummed about that because that was <laughs> really nice. So like MySpace came out and then we started connecting and uh, getting in touch with other people with CF. I got in touch with the old man, Jerry Cahill up in New York uh, when I first began running, and now we're great friends, but just seeing people like Jerry or Rose in California and connecting with these people on social media kind of helped spark that um, drive in me to keep CF or Rock CF going and growing and then just, just keeping in touch and getting everyone else involved. It, it's been a wild ride. I still don't really know what I'm doing, but um, <laughs> we're good at faking it in Detroit. No, it's been fun. It's been awesome. I don't know. So the non-compliance thing, I know we see in teens, right? Mostly what the CF has, right? It's like 15. Is that when you like, is that peak? Yeah, it's a pretty good number. 15-ish. <laughs> Not like 20. 19, 20. I think, I think for me it was when I moved out on my own and didn't have my parents there to make me do it. Because I was at home very compliant. My parents taught me the medications early on and I think that helped. And like, this is why you do this medication because it does this for you. But... I don't know. I was in that time of my life where, like, if my lung function started to drop a little bit, and I was just having so much fun staying out to four in the morning. Kids, don't do this. Are your kids going to watch this? Oh, boy. <laughs> um, I, and my brother was living with me, so it's like, wow, dude, what were you doing not taking care of me? But I think he had the same mindset of, like, we had that train of thought where CF was just going to be it for me, right? But... Yeah, if I had somebody like a mentor early on to really do that, I think it would help to really say like this is, you, there is hope, you can do this. Because I wasn't seeing people older, older than me thriving, right? And today we have that access through uh, social media or CF uh, Foundation or Rock CF programs where we can show your kids others thriving because of adherence. Not always easy, I'll tell you that. Yeah. How do you get your trophies if you are? That's a great question. <laughs> Um, so tempeh at lunch, uh, a lot of cheese, nuts, um, a lot of vegetables to have protein. I'm actually on Operation Weight Gain right now, so I'm trying to get more protein and figure that out. But a lot of eggs, tofu, a lot of beans. Yeah, sometimes I look at my breakfast and I'm like, dang, that's like 40 grams of protein. That's pretty good. Some protein shakes here and there, but I don't really love those. But yeah, it's very important, especially with recovery and well, after a, a long exercise session. I'll take tips too if you got them. <laughs> yeah. Is your mom a dairy organization? Oh. <laughs> the bar is back there. Um, <laughs> the one is uh, G551D, which Kaladico, 
targets. And then uh, Dell T1078, which is like a super, like 60 people, I think, have it in the world. That one comes from my dad, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but fun fact, my dad is 71 and had two positive sweat tests last year. So we're trying to narrow that down. So I want to start a revolution where we don't just test siblings when a kid's diagnosed. We also test the parents, because I think our speech and writing skills are amazing. You heard it here first. I don't know. He's six foot seven, so he obviously has the, the height thing down, but. <laughs> I mean, that's it. So, yeah, please check out Rock CF. Use us. We're there for the community. So, let's get some shoes, let's get some merch, get some inspiration. <laughs> oh, do you.